Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on the star line by guitarist, teacher, music engineer, and producer. He has played with Wild Cherry, Molly Hatchet, and now Foghat. We welcome Brian Bassett. Hi, Sean. Glad to be here. Brian, let's go Beyond the Mic. Foghat is back on the road for their 52nd year, bringing the blues, hard rock, and boogie around the world. What makes this band so special to you? Well, most importantly, uh, after all this time, we're like a family now, and uh, we really enjoy making music together. We love playing live for the people, and, uh, you know, we just have a blast when we get out there on the road after all these years still. You've played for so many bands as a session guitarist. What session may not have been the most famous, but was the most fun for you? Oh, man, there's quite a few. Uh, as a engineer or session guitarist at Kingsnake uh, Records, um, we had a studio. We were sort of like a Muscle Shoals kind of setup. Um, I think one of my most fun ones was Rufus Thomas, you know, famous for walking the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I always remember that because I, I had him in the vocal booth, in which I didn't have a line of sight. And uh, and so I'm sitting in the control room waiting to hit play, you know, for his vocal track. He, I guess he's waiting on me. And after about a pregnant pause of about a minute, he goes, dollar bill waiting on a dime. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, yes, sir, Rufus Thomas, here it comes, I'll hit, you know, hit record. You know, so that that one sticks out in my mind. We did um, a couple albums with Alex Taylor, uh, James Taylor's older brother, and James Taylor came down and did some sessions uh, for that record. That was a lot of fun. So just uh, uh, we Gate Mouth Brown, a famous you know jazz blues guitarist, we did some work with him. Um, so just meeting all these great blues men and you know famous musicians in the studio and working with them that was a real pleasure brian how has being a working musician helped you as an engineer and studio manager for others you know it's funny i I taught some classes at uh, daytona state college and it's one of the things i brought up all the time in fact i taught classes called contemporary ensemble which were basically school of rock and what it was is everyone it's an engineering program primarily but we made everybody in the uh, program play in a band. You know, I put together four or five different ensembles and we did some concerts. And it, what it did is I think it gave those potential engineers, a, you know, a perspective of being on the other side of the glass, so to speak, where, you know, you're, now you're a musician, you know, as, and so you get that feeling of performing, recording from the other, you know, end of uh, you know, the engineering thing. So for me, that always helped because you can communicate in musical terms. You know, someone says, you know, take me to the bridge or, you know, pick it up at bar such and such so just being a working musician being able to communicate with the people you're recording with on on a musical level really helps why does music touch your soul you know it's a, that's a very interesting question and pretty deep really um from a young age you know i grew up i was into sports i played high school football and uh, was going that way of course the uh, all the exciting music came out in the late 60s and 70s you know, got everybody going, me, my friends, everybody of my age that plays music. Of course, we had all the, you know, the Beatles and the Stones on the Ed Sullivan show, you know, that was a big spark. It was just a very exciting time in music. You know, and uh, I think everyone in my neighborhood got a guitar or a bass or a snare drum or something, you know, when those bands started coming on the television. And um, I, I don't know, it just, you know, spoke to me. You know, I don't sing, so I guess I consider it like a, a voice playing guitar is like a speaking and, uh, you know, I always, uh, when I talk to other guitarists or talk to my students, you know, I say music's not a competition. Like, you know, everyone's always, who's the best guitar player? I, you know, that's an impossible question. There's so many great people. And I say music's a, a conversation. You know, you, you know, you listen, you respond, you, you know, and, and that's why I look at music. And so when you get together with friends and, and have a jam session or, you know, or play with a group of guys like I have for so many years, uh, it's just a way to express yourself, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, I still get the same kick out of plugging a guitar into a Marshall amplifier and turning it up that I did when I was 17 years old. So it's just uh, a lot of fun on top of being a creative outlet. My son is a music education major at the University of Cincinnati Conservatory. Okay. What's one tip you will give any music major from your own experience? Um, well, the first thing I would say is um, no matter wh- how you get to it, try composition you know i think uh, playing music is great i spent you know my whole youth playing in clubs and you know playing cover music so you know learning your craft that way is is one thing that you have to get to depending on your i'm not my daughter's in a percussionist in a college too orchestral so she's always working on music in pieces so you know obviously practice your craft but i would say you know learn to compose 
original music. I mean, that's where all the money is in the, in the music business, particularly the profession, you know, the uh, pop music or rock music. Um, and, and I don't particularly write a lot of music myself, but I like collaborating with other musicians uh, to compose new music. So to me, that's a very important part of being a musician is that personal creative outlet as well as, you know, practice, 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 you know. He spends more time practicing percussion in his marimba than any time in the dorm. That's, exact, that's exactly what my daughter does. She spends 90% of her day in the rehearsal halls, you know, <laughs> I look at, uh, you know, Life 360, you know, it's like sort of a, you know, a program where you can see where your kids are at. And, uh, but I see her, she's like, spends, it's called Presser Hall. She's in there, you know, eight hours a day working with her ensembles and her, you know, different, uh, getting ready for different performances. So that's funny that, uh, our children are doing the same exact thing. Exactly. And when he's not doing that, he's teaching music to middle schoolers and then band camp. Yeah. It's great to see our kids have the same passion for the music that we have. Brian Bassett from Foghat joins us beyond the mic for the Rocky and Eight. Brian, all this is is eight random questions. Answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. There is no pressure. All right. Favorite beach that you enjoy? Uh, New Smyrna Beach is where I happen to live. So uh, we have a beautiful beach here in Central Florida. One thing that you take on the road that makes you feel like you're at home? My iPad. Why? <laughs> I don't know. When you're sitting on a plane for four or five hours every other day or, you know, riding, doing a two-hour drive to some venue, it's just nice to have something to you keep your mind occupied. If you had to stay with one type of facial hair for you the rest of your life, Brian, would you stay with the circle beard or move to a mustache or maybe just the extended goatee? Now I'm going with the goatee and the mustache. Yeah, that's been my uh, look as well as it seems to be the look of many mid sixties gents. <laughs> what was your first guitar? And do you still have it? It was a Harmony Rocket One, a big red hollow body guitar. Uh, it was electric. It was sort of like a poor man's gibson 335 had big white knobs on it um i loved it i don't have the exact one but i bought the same exact model off of ebay some years ago so i have a, a replacement for it but that was my first one and it actually still plays pretty good if you could have anything put in your rider what's the one thing that you have to have in there lately it's the uh, tate's cookies <laughs> yes they are really good they're out of uh, out of long island they're delicious of course by the time i get there the crew has pretty much got them all Brian, what was your favorite song to teach in your contemporary rock class? I really like I Can't Find My Way Home, but it's not exactly contemporary, but it's, uh, you know, off the Blind Faith album. That's one of my favorites, and we jam it all the time in uh, Soundcheck. So that's one that, that's not part of our set that I always go back to. It's a great hip song for improvisation and uh, a lot of fun to play, sort of combination of finger-picking and blues, guitar, licking. Uh, that, that one, I always in my mind so who's the musician today that inspires you that's not from fog hat well jeff beck was always my greatest inspiration in fact when i got my first guitar i also received that christmas the first two jeff beck albums which my parents set the bar pretty high on that one but uh <laughs> yes but uh he's always been my greatest inspiration from the guitar you know along with uh well i love you know rod price learning all his parts from the classic fog hat records was uh a deep dive for me to play them correctly and uh, get proficient on the slide guitar. He was a master. Uh, so that was a real challenge. So he, that was obviously a big influence on my playing every day. And, uh, you know, and all the British blues guitar players, I love Peter Green. I love, you know, Clapton, uh, Johnny, you know, and then Johnny Winter, Dwayne, all those guys, you know, as we, the music of our era, it's, you know, had some fantastic guitar players to, uh, learn from amen to that what's the best song from your blues quartet blue house wow uh i hear you knocking by lazy lester we used to play a, uh, our my blues quartet blue house which i had while i was a engineer at king snake we did a lot of obscure southeastern blues but the reason i remember that one in particular is when i first met lonesome dave in the mid 80s he had just come back from england from a hiatus from uh, fog hat and uh my friend Pat Travers, the great guitarist, uh, brought him to see our band. And Dave, being the blues historian that he was, knew every song on our list, which was quite, all the songs were quite obscure, like Lightning Slim and Slim Harpo, all these odd songs. He knew them all and sat in with us. And that was the first song I played with Dave when I first met him. And we hit him up as best friends. And really that night uh, changed my whole life. You know, I, he asked me to play with him, which I did for four years uh, before they reformed. And I, went to Molly Hatchet and then he was gave me the call in 2000 to come back to the band when Rod retired. So that evening 
stands out in particular to me, and that song in particular. If you're enjoying these conversations, please check out another Beyond the Mic episode to find more actors, artists, and people you need to know. We'd also appreciate a like and subscribe on the Good Pods app. It's time for the back half with Foghat's Brian Bassett Beyond the Mic. Brian, how has music changed for the better or the worse recently? Um, I'd say there's a, lot, a couple different perspectives on that. When we were young and, you know, I had a couple great bands that never went anywhere. You know, Wild Cherry, we were lucky enough to have a hit. But in those days, you had to have a record deal to do anything. You know, you couldn't make a record on your own. Um, and so a lot of good songs and a lot of good bands that I played in went by the wayside. I think the good thing about music these days is uh, young people through social media and digital recording have access to, uh, you know, make their own records. It's very entrepreneurial now, which is one of the things I spoke about when I, in my classes. Um, you know, the old record companies would have A&R departments and send out people to find bands. You know, now it's, uh, young people have to, you know, get on YouTube and create their own fan base and then maybe the record companies will come. But I think the access to an audience and the ability to create music on your own is the biggest think, change in music I've seen in my career. Two Grammy nominations, an American Music Award, two platinum records, three gold records, and many other awards throughout your career. But what's the one moment that you cherish from Fog Hat and into music? I'd say the, the, uh, something I talk about all the time. I, I turned down a college scholarship. As I said, I was a into sports and played football in high school and i was somewhat of you know an academic so i had a college scholarship at carnegie mellon which is quite a good school in pittsburgh and i turned it down to go live with uh, a bunch of guys in lima ohio in a condemned building you know because <laughs> we had a house gig at a place called yogi's a little bar in there and uh you know my parents were understanding about it funny enough i thought they would freak out a little bit but they didn't and they were supportive and then some years later, when I was in Wild Cherry, uh, we played, I, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We played the Civic Arena there. I think we were with the Ozzy Brothers. And uh, my parents were in attendance at that show. And so for them to see me have some success and be on the big stage in the city, uh, you know, was a big moment for me, you know, sort of justified my somewhat crazy decision. <laughs> I don't think that's crazy whatsoever. So that's, I, always, I always remember that day, you know, them being in there in attendance while we're up on the big stage. You've played in concerts with a who's who in music. If you could put together a concert of five people you've played with, who would open, who would be the middle act, and who would be the band or solo act that would come on just right before you? Wow. Okay, uh, here we go. Um, let me see. We played with so many great R&B bands. Uh, during the Wild Cherry period, I think we played with just about everybody. I mean, we, our management was the Belkin Brothers, who were concert promoters. So we played with, we see, I'd say uh, Average White Band. I can't put them in any kind of order because they're all great. Uh, Santana, we opened up for them. The original Journey, before Steve Perry, when they were a fusion band, they were fantastic. Earth, Wind, and Fire, we did some of the That's the Way of the World tour. And we actually got to play New Year's Eve with uh, Parliament Funkadelic. And then moving into my rock years, I'd say I love Kansas. I would always, uh, every time we play with them, I run out front and go to the house and uh, watch their show. I love Kansas music. Uh, geez, you know, we just played with ZZ Top last year. Love those guys. And, that, and Billy's band was a big influence on me. I probably played his songs as much as he did in the clubs. Uh, so that's a pretty good lineup right there, I guess. When you were asked to join Foghat, Brian, how did you look back on that opportunity? Well, it's changed my whole life to tell you the truth i mean i was an engineer you know during the week and playing on the weekends in my blues quartet and uh, and i had been doing that for 10 plus years at that point after wild cherry and i relocated to florida that's what i was doing when i met dave and he asked me to start playing with him i went you know i went back out on the road touring um i met my wife in california so i wouldn't have my family if i hadn't you know gone with him uh so really, I, he changed my life entirely. And, and, you know, after working with Dave, um, I met the guys in Molly Hatchet. So at the end of my time with Lonesome Dave's Foghat, Danny Joe Brown asked me to join the band. And I did for seven years until Dave asked me back. And that was 23 years ago now. So uh, that was a fortuitous meeting. I, you know, I call it a pinball moment in my life where all of a sudden you're, your life's going one direction and bing, now it's going somewhere totally different. So, yeah, he, Dave 
meant everything to me, really. Can you talk about the friendship you've had with Dave and the rest of the band and why it makes touring so easy for you? Um, just personality and chemistry, I guess. I think Dave, you know, we would room together in those days. It would be me and Dave and, and, and uh, Riff West, who was our bass player at the time, and Eddie Zine. So we just had two band rooms a lot of the times. And uh, me and Dave could sit in a room for hours and toy with our, you know, early Tandy computer laptops, which weighed about 30 pounds a piece. But, uh, and we could enjoy a comfortable silence. You know, we, we could sit in a room together for four or five hours, not say a thing, and then, you know, but not be uncomfortable. And uh, then we'd go, hey, let's go eat lunch. And it was just, uh, I don't know, it was just how chemistry you have with some people. You just hit it off and it's, um, you become instant friends, lifelong friends. So I think that's a big part of it, really, just the chemistry you have with the people you work with. There are always great stories from the road. What's the one story from the road that you still can't believe it happened, but it did? Well, I guess this is another Wild Cherry story, but we were touring with the uh, Jackson 5. It was their last tour before Michael went solo. And uh, I forget, I, I, I recall it as Madison Square Garden, but I'm, I might be wrong in there. But um, he introduced me to Stevie Wonder, so... <laughs> That one sticks out in my mind pretty big. Brian, who in music now makes you want to head back to engineering full-time, or are you happy where you are? Well, you know, I love listening to great, great produced records. You know, I'm a big fan of Government Mule, and uh, I think uh, Michael, Michael Barbieri is their producer-engineer. I love the Modest Mouse record from some years ago. I thought that was a great production. So, you know, when I listen to a great record, and, and I don't think about the engineering aspect of it and just get into the music, to me, that's a great record produced wise and engineering wise but and i still engineer quite a bit in fact i do all the fog out records and i do work with my friend Stephen dees who's a producer uh we just did a record by a young bluesman called dyer davis that was fantastic and victor wainwright had worked on his records who's a multiple blues award winning pianist so i still keep my hand in engineering quite a bit and um and but uh Still playing is, I guess, my main focus. But when I'm off the road, I, that's what I do. I go back into my home studio and, and work with some of my friends. How did the pandemic quarantine change the way you experience your craft? Wow, that was horrible for everyone I, that I know, um, particularly crew members and people that are in the production end of the business. I mean, everything totally shut down. It was awful. I uh, I was busying myself at that time. We were doing a double live record, so I was able to occupy my personal time with you know some engineering duties. But it was awful, you know, for music, music musicians, you know, technicians. And uh, to see it slowly coming back these last two years has just been a blessing for everyone in the business, you know, in the music business. It's time for one big question with Brian Bassett from Fog Hat Beyond the Mic. Brian, why has your love of music grown over your life? And how do you want people to remember your time in music? Um, no, that's a good question. You know, just remember, you know, I hope... Uh, we entertained them for the time that they came to see our concert. I mean, we are, you know, we play very seriously, you know, but we have a good time and I, that's what we want people to come out and get a bit of a reprieve from their daily lives and rock out a little bit and have some fun. So I just hope that people have seen our shows, enjoyed them. And uh, that's what I want to be remembered for is being a a decent guitarist and a, you know, fairly good entertainer. And um, other than that, uh, you know, to be able to make a living doing something like playing a guitar all your life, uh, you know, I look back on that as pretty much of a blessing. What should people expect when they see Fog Hat in concert now? Some ripping guitars and uh, some pretty high energy uh, rock and roll, some blues, maybe a little bit of funk in there, you know, and uh, and just a good party atmosphere. You know, we we take our fun seriously and we like to get everybody on their feet and, and uh, rocking out. So just a good time, good rock and roll time old school. His first guitar was a Harmony Rocket One inspired by Jeff Beck and turned down an academic scholarship to play music. Brian Bassett from Foghead, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic.